Hi there, my name is Aaron Short, welcome to my YouTube channel. So continuing, continuing with our interview series, um, I'm very happy today because I talk a lot on my channel about acoustic guitar pickups, and a very, very famous acoustic guitar pickup is the Maiden AP5 system and the AP5 Pro, which I've just reviewed on my channel. I've always been a fan, I'm a big fan of Tommy Emmanuel, I've seen him play many times, and I'm a big fan of this system, and I'm so grateful today because I'm joined live from Australia where it's actually tomorrow, <laughs> I'm joined live by Patrick Evans, who's actually at the factory right now. How are you doing, Patrick? Good morning. I'm really well, thanks. And you? I'm good. Thank, thanks again. It's so early there. Have you had your coffee? Uh, no, I haven't had the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't quite manage that, but I have had breakfast and I'm watered, so it's good. This is, I'm so grateful for you doing this for us, and it's so awesome. Like I said, I, I review pickups. I just posted a review of the AP5. Everyone loves it, and I want to get into the details about the history of this system and the, the ways that you use it and any stories about it. But first of all, we, we, we've just met, so can we start by um, having a brief history of yourself and how you got into music and your, where you're from originally? Sure. I'm, I grew up in Geelong, which is a, a, a regional center out of Melbourne uh, in Victoria and I uh, got into music in high school I think you know in the, in the mid 1970s the way so many of us did that was sort of an act of rebellion as much as anything and um, got into guitar absolutely fell in love with guitar and uh, you know I remember being given my first guitar and actually taking it to bed with me like, like the, uh, the old stories that um, and started playing in bands very early and uh, particularly playing in, in folk music and um, Irish music and that sort of thing. And uh, my best friend at school, his dad was an instrument maker. And so when I finished, well, before that, I used to spend you know, every weekend and every possible moment at their place playing music and being surrounded by instruments. And... Um, when I finished school, I went to university, and uh, but which I didn't didn't really work for me that well. And I, I used to hang around his workshop, so they put a chisel in my hand one day and said, "You're here all the time. You might as well do something." So I did, and um, and I've never stopped. So I was 19 then. I'm now 57, <laughs> still doing it. So 
um, that was the, the, the early start. And I've always been utterly fascinated <clears throat> by the way things are made as much as the way they sound. Uh, and I think, you know, an instrument maker is a really good career choice for someone who has those, that combination of, of interests. Definitely, definitely. Um, was, was, your, was your first guitar a Maiden by any chance? No, no, I couldn't afford one of those. <laughs> it was a golden tone. <laughs> Are they Australian uh, too? No, that was a, a, it would have been a Japanese, okay. probably a 1960s Japanese guitar. It had an action you could drive a bus under. <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? When we learn on our first guitar, sometimes they're so hard to play and it puts people off. It's so important to set them up correctly. So you actually built guitars. Did you build a guitar for yourself? And who was the company that you worked for at the time? Uh, they were called Dual Custom Instruments. Unfortunately, they're no longer around, but their instruments are. They made banjos, mandolins, dulcimers, um, mainly banjos. Banjos became their, their calling card. And um, so I helped do that for about three years. Uh, and then... I went from there into a, a retail store in Geelong where I did teaching, setups, retail, repairs, you know, mm. kind of everything. And um, learned an awful lot there. And I, I came to Mayton in 1993 Okay. Uh, at the age of 30. Is that the first you'd heard about them as a company, like getting a job or did you? Oh, no. No, I owned one, but I, I got a, bought myself a Maton in the mid '80s uh, as a consolation uh, thing for a, a failed relationship. You know, so I bought the guitar. Still got that <laughs> guitar. It's a pretty. It's, it's my everyday guitar, actually. I still use it. Did you write some songs on that one? <laughs> I've written thousands of songs on that yeah. guitar, and it's yeah, it's it's lovely. <laughs> So I had a guest before that worked for another company and he said he went to the company because he, he liked the company and basically asked for a job. Is that what you did? Did you think, well, I built guitars, I've done retail, I love making guitars, I'm going to go and ask for a job? Or did it, how, how did that job come about and how did you get the job? Um, well, I, I was happy enough where I was in Geelong. Uh, you know, I was building custom electrics and uh, as, as well as teaching music and retail. So all of those things, I kind of liked that mix, but um, we had a, a recession, in, a local recession in the Geelong area in the early 90s. We had one in Australia, but Geelong being an industrial centre was particularly affected. And the economy was looking awful in the town. Um, so I realised that the writing was on the wall. Also, I think I, I was pretty keen on my music career at the time. And it seemed to me that Melbourne offered a whole lot more opportunity, uh, being a, a large city. Um, so I, I did that as well. And so I came up with the twin idea of, of advancing my playing career and um, taking the instrument making to the next level. So I actually rang the factory uh, and I spoke to Neville, our, our director, and I came up and had an interview. and. And uh, got the job, which was awesome. I was really uh, excited about it. That's nice. So you, so you called them and you said, look, I want a job there. So that, I, I, like, yeah. I like those stories. You know, when, when people go there and they, they, they like the company already and they want to work for mm. that company. That's really great. But yeah. having said that, I'm, I'm, I'm sure some people don't, aren't, aren't familiar with the history of Maiden Guitars. My, my, the first time I saw them was in, when I lived in London. There was a guy, you might know him, he's called Tommy Rando. And he plays. No, I don't. He, well, he plays guitar for for the, like the the, um, the neighbors guy, Carl Alan Fletcher. Oh, oh yes, <laughs> he yes, plays yes. in his band. So neighbors is bigger in England than it is in Australia, by the way. Yeah. But it's a, it's a yeah. so it's a TV soap. But he played a diesel mini, um, three quarter size diesel Maiden on a stage yeah. in London, yeah. and I sat there and thought that sounds great. And this is a time when a friend of mine told me my pickup didn't sound good in my guitar. And I thought that looks cool. It's easy to carry around and it sounds great. So I asked him what it was and I went to the local dealer and I got one. And indeed, I had that guitar. I gigged that for a long time. People laughed because I'm actually 6'5". So those, those guitars look very small on me. <laughs> so it was, but that was good for me too. And, I, and then um, recently I had the, I've got the Nashville. The Nashville guitar is kind of a, big, it's kind of a bigger version of that guitar, I, I feel. Um, kind of looks a bit better on me, but... Just great guitars, great systems. I gigged that guitar for so long, so many places, and it always sounded great because of that pickup. But before we talk about the pickup, 
what is the history of the company? Like what year did it what year did it start and why was it started and, and who founded the company? It was it was founded by Bill May in uh, 1946 in Melbourne and it started in a single car garage in a suburb called Thornbury, which is uh, an inner northern suburb of Melbourne. Uh, and he and his brother Reg, he, he had his brother Reg working with him. They they got started in 1946, uh, making both sort of flat top guitars of the time and arch top guitars. And uh, they made a success of it. They got they got their um, got their their guitars into you know some premier shops around the country, and um, around about. 1950, 1948, 1950, they built a, a purpose-built factory in uh, in um, uh, on Canterbury Road here, which is not far from where we are now. And um, that factory served them through till about 1990. Uh, Bill actually retired and sold the company to his daughter, Linda, and son-in-law, Neville, who now own the company. And... Um, that happened in the, the late or mid eighties. And then they stayed in that, that Canterbury road factory till, uh, about 1990. They relocated to a place in Bayswater, uh, which is out East in the, the same in Melbourne, uh, 1990. And we moved from there to here in 2002. We're currently in Box Hill. Did they have any famous players? Before Tommy Emmanuel and the AP5 system, when they made the purely acoustic yeah. guitars, did they have any yeah. famous players touring with them back then? Oh, well, the Seekers played our guitars oh. extensively. Um, Frank Ifield played them. Uh, George Harrison played a Maton for a period. Really? Uh, That's, the, I didn't know that. Sixty-three. With, yeah, with the beat with the Beatles. Good footage of it. Oh right. Yeah. Very cool. Yep. Very cool. That was uh, that was I believe his. Country Gentleman, I think it was, was being refretted and repaired. So he had this one for about three months, I think, hmm. uh, in that period. Um, oh, dear. Uh, lots and lots of Australian uh, top line performers uh, were playing our guitars right through that period. Um, Normie Rowe, uh, who was a, 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 still is, is a, a well-known Australian artist, um, yeah, the list is enormous of, of people, Australian performers playing our guitars uh, right through from, you know, from the 50s through up till now. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm aware of that. Of course, whenever I see Keith Urban, Tommy Emmanuel, they also love the fact that they're, they're being patriotic, right? They got their, their Australian guitars, but they are, they are. It's amazing to me that they're so well known around the world, though, because of the... I mean, I'm not discounting the sound of them without the pickup, but the pickup is definitely something that's talked about around the world and how great they say and plugged yeah. in, of course. Now, yeah. before yeah. what? OK, I've got some questions then. So what year was the AP5 in its, in its initial incarnation? What year was that um, created and put into a Maton? Uh, that, that would have been 1995. OK, that, that's that's the uh, that was the first AP5 uh, incarnation. Okay, and um, before that, been, was there any yeah. before that was there any like third party system used, or were they purely acoustic? Yeah, no. Well, we had our own systems before that too. Oh, okay. Um, we actually had pickups because Maton made a lot of electric guitars too, hmm. um, particularly uh, from the late fifties through to the sort of mid seventies. I think electric guitars were were as much a focus as, as acoustic. Hmm. Um, so we had, we were quite familiar with pickup technology. Um, and there were, we've got examples around the factory and I've, I've worked as a repairer here over the years and done a lot of restorations on guitars from say the early to mid seventies. And they used to have a, a system where they had a combination of a, a magnetic pickup kind of under the 20th fret and a stylus off a record player under the bridge mm. and a blend system that um, 
that blended them together. So wow. So we we were trying to amplify them, um, you know, certainly from the early seventies onwards. How, how were those? How, how were those systems? Were they effective? Were they kind of were they used by the artists? Mag the magnetic wasn't bad. Mm. Um, the little stylus thing just introduced a scratchy, <laughs> <laughs> a scratchy sort of um, very brittle sound. Okay. But I think, I mean, I, I can remember, you know, the first time I heard acoustic guitars plugged in, which would have been in the late 70s, I suppose, mm. myself. And I can remember thinking how amazing that sounded uh, relative to what I'd heard before. And it actually, in retrospect, would have been really horrible. But it was, it was kind of new and exciting. And listen to that guitar. You can hear it. It's loud, you know. So. Mm. So I think at the time it was it was regarded pretty well. So I was I was born in 1980, and doing my research on pickups, I feel like a lot of players just use microphones on stage. I'm not. I'm trying to fill in the gaps with those like the 70s. I, I've just learned about John Martin using effects and magnetic pickups, but Maiton always made their own pickup. They never used a third party. Is that right? I oh, know we we did we did use a third party uh, after those experiments. Uh, we made a we used a pickup made by Aria, mm. which was an under saddle coaxial transducer type thing. Okay. And uh, that was in the eighties and that worked quite well at low volume. It was actually quite pleasant at low volume. It got mm. a bit brittle and very feedback prone at high volume. Uh, so there was that one for a few years. And then um, we started using these um, uh, under saddle type pickups. So that these, I've got an example here. This is this is our current piezo pickup. We started using a version of that mm. uh, running through various preamps. And this thing here is actually the first one that we were using. Oh wow! The first preamp, yeah. What were those controls so on there? Was that volume, treble, and bass? Yes, exactly. Oh. Yeah. So that that was the first system we were using. So they they were turning up from about 80, uh, 80, 86, 87 onwards. Okay. In our guitars, yeah. And what was that called? Was there a name for that system? That was called the Wayne system. Oh, how do you spell that? W A Y N E. Wayne. Is there a reason for that? <laughs> Yeah, it was a brand. Well, they are actually a, a, another Australian company. Mm. It was a brand uh, called Wayne, and they over the years they did, you know, guitars and pickups and all sorts of systems. Um, and that was that was the Wayne. So, oh, so that was sorry. That was those. that was a was that a third party then? That wasn't made by. Yeah. Okay, so that was a third party system. So how yes, did, how did you? They go actually. Okay. Well, they they actually came in as partners, I think, at my okay. time. Okay, okay. Um, for a while, yeah. Because it looks similar to what we have now. So, how did they go yes. from that? What was the what was the idea behind the AP five then? What, why why did they? How did they transition from that? Oh, there's another one. Yeah. What's, what's that? Here's another one. So, what happened was uh, that relationship ended. That business relationship ended, mm. and. Uh, Maton needed to, and this was just before my time, Maton needed to develop a system of their own. So this was it. This was the Maton system. We used to call it the 4C, being four controls. Uh, and it was the same, same idea, um, the same kind of pickup. Mm. Oops, trying to find one. Yeah, there we go. The same sort of pickup. Uh, and it was fairly basic system. The battery mounted in the back. So oh, right. that was mounted on the side of the guitar. That was mounted in the back. Hmm. Um, it, it was a good sounding system. It was very, very gutsy. So it was a sort of, you know, if you're playing in the pub and you wanted to kick it along, hmm. it's a system you can really do that with. Um, tended to, if you thump the guitar, it tended to make the speakers jump out of the cabinets and across the room so it had that really um high output to it mm. and um yeah so that was the system we developed before the op5 we ran with that from about 1990 
92, uh, through to 96, hmm. thereabouts. Yep. Now, I've got to talk about Tommy Emmanuel. Obviously, his name is, hmm. is linked to the company so much. Did Tommy Emmanuel use that system, or did he only ever start using yeah. the current? He did use that system. No, he used, he used all of them. He did? Okay. Uh, yes, because, see, I, I, Tommy came on board. Uh, Tommy played Maton as, as a young man and as a child. Yeah. And, um, and then he, he was playing Takamini for a while mm. uh, in that um, 80s period. And he came on board in the, in the mid to late 80s. I'm not, not sure exactly what year. Uh, and he was using that, you know, this system. Right. And, um, and then he was stuck with us and, and really guided us through uh, as we kept going from one system to the next. And he was, uh, he was a really hard taskmaster, I have to say, because he takes a pickup. He, he uses every possible um, degree of, 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 of output and of tone that that pickup can deliver. Yeah. And he was continually pushing us to, to, to get better. And, and, you know, we, we ran a lot of, uh, in that, those days, we ran a lot of pickups were in that were experimental. So they, uh, they had all sorts of bits and pieces hanging off them. Yeah. Uh, he ran an 18 volt system for a good while. Mm, more headroom, um, right? Oh, yeah, more headroom. And all about just having that real immediacy. Mm. Um, so, you know, I remember him, him saying, you know, I want the audience to feel like they've got their head inside the sound. Inside pod. the guitar. Then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Hofner is on the chat. He says, I thought Tommy Emmanuel designed the pickup. So what, what was the actual, I mean, did Maiton go to him? Was he just around at the time? What was the actual relationship with that AP5? Was that, what, did, we, he, did he essentially we, design it or just give feedback? Well, the, the, I, I suppose that the, the scaffolding of the pickup existed. Mm. So we knew, we knew essentially what, what it was like. So what we would do with Tommy is we would go, we, we, we had a technician, an in-house technician that was working for us. We would uh, come up with a, an EQ, a curve and so forth. We'd take it to Tommy. What do you think? He'd say, ah, you know, change this, change that. That's good. Keep that. We'd go back, do that. We'd bring it back. Uh, and so it was a, um, uh, it was a case of taking, taking what we were doing to Tommy, getting his feedback, making changes, going back. So it was a collaborative design. Right. I think it's the best way to describe it. Right. Right. That's awesome. So a question I had for you then, what does AP5, is that acoustic pickup five? Is that what that yeah. means? Yeah. And what does the yeah. five mean? Has there been an AP one, two, three, four? Why is that AP5? Um, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> My question has been answered. Yes. Awesome, awesome. So this, yeah, yeah. Now, why is that? Let's, let's, let's break this thing down then. So that preamp you've got, mm. the preamp in your hand there. Why is yeah, it? That's the AP5. Yeah. Why is it such a... Big hunkin thing. Like what's what's inside that? Um, the main. It's actually carrying the battery. Produces the depth. Right. To to house to house that. So it's very actually easy inside it. Very easy to um, change the batteries, right? Which I think is important on these stage yeah, guitars. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Inside this, uh, and this is the AP5. This is not the Pro. Okay. So this is the predecessor. Inside this are two circuit boards. They're quite. A, there's a lot of circuitry, and the two boards fold out. Mm. So they're folded together and sit inside the uh, the box like so. Uh, then you've got you've got all the, the faders are all mounted on that board. So the boards first. Yeah, you know, the the circuit board is effectively that size, and you've got two of them. One um, uh, folded over, one under the other. So that's that's really the size. The size is determined by the size of the circuit board. Now this is mid nineties, remember? Yes. So these days you could you could produce the same uh, size, so, you know, a circuit board smaller, would be a, right? a fraction of that size. Now, in fact, the largest parts would be the controls. Right. So is the AP5 yeah. Pro a smaller unit, or is it the same size? There's the Pro. It's the same size. Okay. But 
it's only got one board, not two. Okay. So a, a lot of surface mount um, ICs and so forth that, that mean there's a greatly reduced footprint. Um, as far as the, this size goes, we feel, well, partly if something works, don't mess with it, I guess. Mm. <laughs> but we also feel that that's, that's a size that you can work with on stage. Yes. And uh, I have to say that as a person of, um, who was not as young as I used to be and have to wear glasses now, and I, I'm still vain enough to think that I can get away without wearing glasses on stage, <laughs> I can barely see it. So if it was any smaller, I'd be shocked. So. I, I can imagine Tommy saying, I need to see the controls. I need to, because he'll play a song and adjust mm. it mid song you know, when you watch yeah. him play. So it, I do think the controls have to be a good size. And I think you've got a great size there. But you just gave me a question because you said you could shrink them now. So my question for you now is why haven't you shrunk it to make that unit smaller and lighter than it is? Uh, good question. <laughs> we, we, I suppose you know, some of it was. Um, yeah, look, it's, it's a good question. I think firstly, that side, that size, yeah, is set. Is kind of predetermined. Yes. Uh, we also did want to, when we were considering this, we did want it to be retrofittable into the older guitars. Right. Right. So the whole that hole you would want to be the that's same. That's good. So you can upgrade your old system, right? That's good. Yeah, I that's like that. right. That's important. That's right. Mm. As far as the box goes, you could. Well, the battery's still there, so you've still got. Right. That depth is still set by the right. the battery length of the batteries. Right. Um, you you could reduce otherwise you could reduce the size of it, but there's no really no weight issue just in the box. The weight okay. is what's inside the box. Okay. So there's not not any kind of weight benefit to it. And the mic is um, stuck I, on there I'm, too, right? I can see that. And the mic's on there. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's all yeah. in one. That's nice. So the mic's on a boom that you can. You can maneuver into uh, the best spot, I suppose. Mm. I got to mention those batteries because when I was at NAM, I did a video with this YouTuber, my friend Henning, and we were talking to, I think it was Yamaha's, they use AA's AA batteries. And I said yeah. to him, Why do you use them? And he laughed at me, like, Why are you talking about batteries? You're such a geek. But I was reading an article mm. about Maton, the AP5, and it said that you get more power from the AA's than a, than a 9 volt. Is that true or is that? Misinformation. We, yeah, yeah. We, no, no. What we do is, is we have a, um, uh, it's a technical thing, but we basically use the two cells to generate the voltage. Mm. So we actually run at 12 volts. Okay. Using the two cells uh, to, to create those 12 volts. Mm. And, and that's the key. So whereas a nine volt system basically operates starts at nine volt and the battery slowly loses charge until you can hear it it starts distorting and so forth with the uh with this system it operates at 12 volts continuous mm. until the batteries die and then it just right. stops. and I so so yeah that's that's really what that's about so the double a's yeah that would make sense yeah so it is good to use them so henning take yeah. that and also, I, I I really appreciate the fact that that system, I think it lasts about 100 hours or something. It seems to last a long time, which I think is, again, for stage is it important. Does. I think it's important. Yeah. Let's talk, let's talk about well, some... Well, not only that, but sorry if I can. No, no, go. That LED. Yes. The little, yeah, that LED comes on well before, if, if it comes on and stays on, there's two reasons. And one of them is that your batteries are low. Yes. But it, you can play your whole gig with that light on and then replace your batteries. But once, right. that, once that light's on, yeah. And, and when the batteries go, it's typically you don't begin to hear it distort and you're wondering whether your batteries are low. It stops working right? If the, when the batteries right. run out. But I like that. Some companies hide that light inside the guitar and you'll never see it. So I think it's yes. great. It's very, again, great decision. Um, let's talk about the control itself. I just reviewed it and I'm, I'm really happy with it. But one thing I, I said in my review is that there's many combinations that you could do with the mic, the pickup and the EQ for sound. And that's just in the guitar, let alone external EQ, of course. Mm. So that's all fine. And if you watch Tommy Emmanuel, he'll say, I run everything at maximum flat out and cover the sound hole. That's mm. fine too. 
But as you work for the company, what's your philosophy on using that system? Like all the, can you just show us the, so we've got bass, middle, treble, which only affects the, the um, piezo, right? And then the microphone. Yeah, yeah. What's your, yeah. what's your company's um, kind of spiel or your solution of using those on stage? What, 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 what tips would you give a new user yeah. that's new to the system? Yeah, okay. Um, the first thing I would say is that each of these sliders and the rotary pots has a notch in the center and that notch is what we call flat. So that will produce the curve that we've created, the frequency curve that we've created that set that, that we feel represents the natural acoustic sound of the instrument as much as possible. Um, so that's true of the, the mid sweep and cut and boost true of the bass treble uh not so of these these are the gains going to the microphone going to the piezo we'll talk about them a bit separately but if you if you've got no microphone in it and you set your all of these flat at that midpoint you'll get what we consider our our pre-built sound or the curve that we built into it mm. um, that we feel accurately reflects our, our guitar sound. So that's that's that. And the tone network being the uh, bass treble and the mid-range, mid-sweep, only applies to the piezo, not to the microphone, which I know you said in your review, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit about that, why we went there in, the, in, in a second. Um, now the the setting that we would suggest, and that that certainly when I do I do lots of gigs in in lots of different settings, but a lot of them are in bars, mm. where you know it's a pretty noisy environment. And the setting that I recommend is to have basically everything flat, have the volume the master volume at about seventy five percent and have the piezo volume at about 75%. And that gives you a bit of headroom, mm. should you need it. If you need to, you know, you're gonna, uh, if you're playing, uh, you know, strumming behind a few songs and then you want to do something a bit more delicate, it gives you a bit of headroom to deal with that on, on, you know, on stage rather than have to reach over to the mixer or whatever. And then as far as the microphone setting goes, uh, we talk about sort of 20, 20 to 30 percent microphone blend with with the um the volume and that that's a fairly safe stage setting that won't get you into feedback territory um and it will just add that little bit of sparkle and probably more more important it'll add a little little bit of sustain to the treble notes when you're playing single note passages so that's our kind of factory idea of where where you would set the um, set the controls, but then the uh, with the microphone, it's really completely up to you as to how you use it. That's that's our uh, our setting for security's sake. I've actually experimented with a lot, and I'm sure most people have. Um, and I find that different rooms and different systems respond differently uh, to the way you set the mic. So quite often I'll, I'll put you know, up to 50%. I'll have the mic up to where the notch is. I'll have 50% microphone if it's a quiet room and I've got a listening audience, I, I might wind a bit more of that in. Um, I will say that if I'm in a band and I've got a rhythm section going on, I just take the microphone out because mm. I find it's it it's so to, you know you're starting to work at higher levels and beginning to get um, uh, into feedback territory and there's so much going on sonically that that subtlety of the added mic kind of gets lost in the hi hats and all that sort of stuff so mm. so I tend to pull it out if I'm using it in, in a band yeah because the system I had in my mini mate on diesel didn't have a mic it was just it was just the piezo and that sounded incredible by itself. Yeah. And then I know there was the AP5, there was the AP5 mic where the mic was glued into the sound hole, so you couldn't adjust the position. But on the AP5 yeah. Pro, you've got that gooseneck. So, 
So yeah. do, do, you, what, do you have a preference of where you put the mic inside on that gooseneck? Yeah, I, I do. I'm, and I experiment with that a lot. And it, it um, uh, general rule of thumb is to move it so that it's uh, so that if, if the sound hole's here, to put it so that it's just on the perimeter of the sound. Can, can you hole. just hold up a bit more on the camera? That's better. Sorry. Yeah. So, so if the sound hole's there, yeah. you'd have the mic just on the perimeter uh, of the sound hole. Ah. Uh, so if that if that's the the hole. Yes. So just around there is a sweet spot, and mm. that'll give you the mellowest version of the microphone. Right. If you like. Right. And then the further away you go, you're coming closer to the bridge. It gets a bit brighter and a bit harsher. Yeah, that's where mine is right. Good depending on that's where mine is yeah. right now, and I I felt it wasn't slightly slightly harsh there. So you're saying if it's closer to the sound hole, it'll mellow it out a bit more. That's yes, that's good. Will. Okay, cool. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And then you can actually, if you're um, recording, if you're you're plugging directly in and and. Uh, when we developed this, we spent a lot of time on headphones as well as mm. through PAs. Mm. But um, I've found if you're recording, quite often uh, if I'm building a song, I might just put down a, a, a guide track. Mm. And for that, I can't be bothered setting up the microphones and so forth, so I just plug straight in. Mm. And I've found that if I have the, the microphone almost in the center of the sound hole, mm and have the microphone turned up mm. high, mm. I've, I've actually got a sound that's good enough that I ended up leaving it in the recording. It was it was as nice an acoustic sound as I had using the condenser mic, you know? Yeah, it's more like a mic outside the guitar, can... right? When it's in the sound hole. Yeah, yeah. But obviously on stage, yeah, that it, could it actually... be back on stage like, if you did it like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Not, not appropriate on stage, yeah. but in recording, yeah. a really good way to do it. Yeah, Bob says, "Does the EQ work on the mic?" No, the mic is no. nothing affects the mic. And is there a reason why? Because I, I, I've covered systems on here where they have a crossover. Is there a reason why that mic? Did you ever experiment with having a crossover, or did you always just want the mic to be like treble frequencies on top of the existing pickup sound? Well, when we started, we um, we our intention was to try and get a microphone working uh in the system that could be uh, the idea was we could have a microphone or a piezo or both mm. that was our our um starting point uh and and we we were able to using different mics uh we were able to get a pretty pleasing microphone tone um but it wasn't usable live. We were just, yeah. we had so much trouble with feedback that you had to put the feedback buster in, which kind of rendered the whole idea um, pointless. Um, well, we, so we ended up, and, and, and listening, you know, part of our, uh, the testing we were doing was using all sorts of mics, including mics external, internal. Um, running the things through systems and listening to the result. And we realized that the piezo did a beautiful job of everything under sort of 1K. Mm. And that the microphone, the magic in the microphone was 1K and above. So we we came to the realization that um, having, a, having the piezo working in those lower frequencies was actually creating mud rather than helping to improve the tone. Mm. So eventually we, we created a curve where we wound, we rolled off the bass mm. below 1K. Um, but as well as that, we were running EQ across the whole range, you know, across both inputs. And it became utterly confusing as to what you were trying to control. Mm. So you'd have two inputs two sources one being the microphone one being the piezo you're hearing this horrible mid-range sound yeah and you're thinking right we'll pull that out and right away you've you've also taken out what was pleasing about the other source or the other input right so short of having two eqs one for the mic and one for the for the um piezo mm. we 
we realised that we didn't really need to be controlling the frequencies of the mic below 1K because those those frequencies were beautifully produced by the piezo anyway. Mm. So we were able, we isolated the mic and we found that we basically built a curve for the microphone where we thought this enhances the frequencies we want to okay. add to the piezo sound. Okay, that makes that sense. sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And also, yeah, you can do things like stereo outputs and extra, but then it gets confusing for a lot of people. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff. So I think, I think, it's yeah. a, I think you've got a great middle ground there. You've got a lot of control, but still, you know, plug. You know, not not too many controls. I know it must be difficult to mm. to please everyone, but I think I think it works well. Um, so there was an AP4. So was that one less control yeah. then? What was the AP4? Yes, yes. So the AP4 uh, came out for our two to five range of guitars, which was our um, entry level guitars at the time. And essentially, that just had a fixed mid control, so it didn't have the sweepable mid, just had the fixed mid range. Mm. Um, and, and yeah, so hence the AP4. Now, you know, if we'd kept with that sort of um, naming idea, we would have had this would have been the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the AP7, <laughs> <laughs> if we'd gone that way. <laughs> yeah. So why is that still called the AP5? If it's got seven, ah, uh, because the because the AP five had become iconic. Right. Okay, makes sense. By that time, yeah, everyone knows that so name. So we though. wanted, yeah, yeah, we wanted to say we we want to make sure we didn't uh, mess with that. Mm. Um, so we called it the AP five Pro, being that it was the professional version. Okay. Yeah, you know, with the with the microphone. And now, so now the current lineup is the AP five Pro and the AP five Original. Is that correct? Original. And that's that's without the mic. That's right. Right. Yep. Okay. 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 I think I'm up to date with that now. So that's the preamp. Can you just show us the part that goes under the saddle, basically the the other yes. the other part of the system? Yeah. So um, uh, let's, sorry. Let's a... And what's that changed at all over, over the years? Is that the same component, or has that been modified for the AP5 Pro? Uh, basically, it's this. It, it, uh, it has been modified. Sorry, I'll show you. It's essentially the same idea mm. so this is the pickup for the op5 pro um that's the the housing the aluminium channel you'll see can you see there's a, a pc board yep printed six yep 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 so the pizos sit on top of that like uh, so okay and then they have a strip that sits on top of that okay. and bolts that come through like so. Uh, that's, that's what you can see on top of the guitar, right? Those yeah, bolts, that's what you can see they're holding the, the pickup. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's right. So that's, that's the whole assembly. Wow. Um, so this has changed over the years <laughs> in just a few small ways. One being that we now have that circuit board. I've um, got an old... Um, do I have an older one? Yeah, the older older versions just had a, a, a strip like so that the piezo sat on. Oh, so now they're separate. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. Well, it's it's actually con it's continuous. Mm. It's just um, isolated by a circuit board. Okay. Uh, underneath that, that is one output. Mm. So some people with uh, but the sorry, I was just going to say some people have a yeah. problem with string imbalance. Does this system allow yeah. you to adjust the volume of strings? Or, or not? No. So what would you, no. how would you, how would no. you, how would you, you just have to make sure the bottom of your saddle is flat, right? To make sure everything's the same volume? There's no way, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There'll be, well, the, the system houses, so I've got stuff all over the place here. <laughs> I was determined not to do this. Here we go. Got it. So the piezos sit like so. Now there's only one output. So you, you, you don't have access to, individual string signals okay there's one output that that's our bridge okay. that's the underside of the, the bridge that sits in those holes there and then we have the um this strip on top okay it sits like so so that's our that's our assembly 
Now, your yes, string balancing issues, if you have them, and our system's really robust in that way. It's a lot less temperamental than most okay. in terms of string balance. But if you do have string balancing problems, the first one is likely that these these cap screws are not tight enough. Mm. People make the mistake of thinking you can lower the action with those. Right. And as soon as you do that, you take tension off the piezos and that can um, create a string imbalance or a strange signal or, and also earth hum. It can introduce an earth hum if they're not done up properly. Ah, uh, okay. So that's the first thing. The second is if this strip, if that strip is not sitting properly on top of the piezos, you can lose a string signal that way. Um, which might be if one of the piezos isn't being properly contacted, you'll still hear the string, but you won't hear it through that piezo. Okay. So you'll have a lesser signal on that note, on that string, than on the others. Um, and then the last one is if the bottom of the saddle isn't perfectly flat, yeah. and it needs to be perfect or close to perfectly flat, mm. uh, you won't get proper pressure down on the on the strip there and once again you won't make contact with the pieces okay so, so I, I guess in yes sorry you said, in principle yeah go ahead there you go <laughs> okay so okay. it's a quick, quick quick question you can still remove your saddle and shave it down to lower the action you, it's, yep. it's okay to do that just don't touch those screws yes, right okay okay don't yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so in principle if you've got balancing problems it's because one or more of the piezos is not making proper contact with this strip. Mm. That's the essence of it. Okay. So as long as that strip's contacting, you will get signal. Okay. But you feel it's less temperamental than other third-party kind of... Understand. Sure, yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, I've, I've done, uh, over the years, I've done many repairs and services on, on all sorts of systems. Mm. And um, it's it's... It's a, a lot less uh, finicky or temperamental than many other systems. The strips that sit in the saddle, so the true under saddle pickups, which sit in the strip in the pickup slot yeah. under the saddle, depend on the bottom of the saddle being perfectly flat. So the bottom of the bridge being perfectly flat that they sit on, and then the saddle being perfectly flat sitting on top of them, and the string pressure creating enough pressure to uh mm. to get the piezos charts to make them work the fact that we've got a strip with a with a two bolts holding it down that thing's under pressure right away mm. even with that string tension on it's lively yeah and and i find it to be very I, i've been using it on my live streams it's like it's I got, i'm not sure the word what the word is i'll say powerful immediate like it's just like that that pickup is like a punch in the face when you when you hit a, and I know yeah. I notice when you dig in it doesn't kind of you know it still has an element of the I, I keep calling I don't like the word quack but it's still there but not as much as others and it just has this really full powerful sound and then when you bring the mic in it just adds that air and that naturalness to the sound so I, I love yeah. that and then you mentioned it earlier um, you said Tommy wanted an immediate punch you know yeah. big sound that's exactly what it gives you I I completely agree with yes, that that's right. So um, okay, I got some. I, we've got some questions. I think we've covered the system pretty in pretty good detail yeah. there. I've got some questions for you. Feel free to answer yeah. them or not, because <laughs> yeah. I've got some here that I thought we might get. Okay, first of all, everyone that's here, thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Um. Okay, Hoffner says the acoustic tone is brilliant. Um, not many know about how good the sound is and sustain. The sustain is great. Is this something you're working on to keep improving in the future? So the actual construction of the guitar itself. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah and the sh short answer to that is yes. Yeah. Uh, we've been we've been on a sustained improvement drive on our acoustic tone specifically since about 2012. Um, we've always been working on it, yeah, but sure. we've been consciously working on it hard since that time, and we continue to do so. Uh, in the, I mean, in, in the, we're always looking for that El Dorado. I, I, I sent. I would say. Mm. He goes on to say, uh, "You're known for your pickup, Sam, but will you move forward to keep up with companies like Collings 
that are known for their pure acoustic sound. I mean, the thing is, what I've discovered from this journey of, of acoustic guitar pickups, the reason I got on the journey is that I wanted to have something like a Collings, not maybe not Collings, but I'll, I'll use that as that was in the question. I wanted something like a Collings that sounded like a Maiden plugged in. But it's very hard to get the best of both worlds because once you start putting stuff in the guitar, of course, you're going to change the sound of the guitar. Right? It's just, it's just physics. Yeah. It's just physics. Yeah. But I have to say, yeah. the things you've shown us, the components of that system, they're not super invasive, and they're all kind of solid. And actually, it made me think of something, because I'm sure someone's going to ask me, has anyone, well, the question is, do you sell those pickup? do you sell those as pickups alone? And do you know of anyone that's tried to retrofit that into another guitar? And do you endorse uh, that or not? Okay. The first thing is, yes, we sell the systems, mm. but usually as, uh, as, upgrades into matons mm. um my i've just just got a, a a power message there on my phone so i'm going to plug this into the mains make sure oh, we yeah, don't lose yeah, it. yeah please i'll uh, i'll be back in one yeah second. yeah of course thanks for your questions guys they're awesome very good questions and let me know if you've got any more while, while we're on the line about any, anything we've just talked about so far please let us know if you've got any questions if i missed anything and hi jay hey jason how you doing from germany it's pretty amazing. I'm in New York City talking to Australia, and we've got Germany and the UK in here. <laughs> okay, we're back. We have, awesome. We have power. <laughs> we have power. Yes. Um. So, so, so the uh, you're talking about the invasiveness or the weight and all, and so. Well, forth. I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not trying. I'm. I'm just. Try, I'm just trying to present to you questions that I've heard over the years. Mm. I, I'm not saying I agree with them, but I'm just trying mm. to discuss them. And I don't feel. I mean. I think it's good for always, like you said earlier, it's always good to make things smaller and lighter as, as much mm -hmm. as you can. At the same time, you want to have the controls, as you stated, and you've got batteries in there. Yep. Um, yep. But, I, I, so, but my real question was, have you, had, have you had people want to retrofit them, and is that something that you kind of tell people not to do, I guess? Uh, well, well, yes, we have. Um, one of the things that's uh, peculiar to our guitars is that our... X brace. I wish I had a soundboard here to show you, but underneath the the board we've got an X brace like so. And if that's the X brace, sound holes here, bridge is here. That space, and it's it's actually a lucky coincidence because that the angle, our angle on the X brace was created by Bill May years ago. That space is wide enough to allow us to fit this saddle, this bridge pickup underneath the saddle and not impact the X bars mm. on many guitars by other makers that that angle is closer mm. and and this edge can actually impact on the X bars. so uh -huh. you, you do have to route a hole through this okay. through the soundboard for this thing to go in so you certainly don't want to be um, routing into your X bracing which is kind of like cutting the spine mm. uh, of the guitar so um, We've actually, uh, our guitar is designed and built around that installation. Okay. Um, it's, yeah, you, you wouldn't put it in another make without being very sure that it was going to carry the, uh, the pickup safely and that you wouldn't weaken the soundboard structure by putting that slot in it. Okay. So, so you um, can do it, but you're going to have to... You probably gonna have to modify the guitar um the mate yeah, the mate yeah. is built around the system so you're better off just getting that's a mate right. in the first place right that's what i would say that, that that's absolutely true yeah 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 because i mean we haven't really i i, I i'm talking i'm focusing on the pickup today because i review pickups but they are also very playable great guitars in their own right i love i mean i like one and three quarter inch nut widths but they're slightly they're slightly smaller but i find that very comfortable they seem to ship with a lower action, which I find really nice. Of course, you can always adjust that yourself or have it modified by a tech. But they, they seem to be very playable. But they are still... I think there's a kind of myth about, well, there's all that stuff in the guitar. It won't sound as good as other guitars. I don't think that's true. I think any yeah. pickup... I think other pickups with less stuff can actually impact the sound as well. And I think it's particularly the... Obviously, all guitars are different. But the Nashville I have is behind me here. I, I'll, I'll show it to the camera, but um sounds great unplugged in, in my demo i actually play it into the microphone it sounds really good and then the pickup sounds really good too so but of course all companies are always continuing to develop their their build and their electronics right yeah yeah having said that well uh, sorry having said that there's there's a big push now into 
impulse responses with um, things like Tone Dexter and Aura systems. And do Maiden have a have a have a any thoughts on that? Like, do you do research into that kind of stuff, or are you kind of set on the analog system that you have now? Oh no, ne ne never say never. Mm. Um, we've certainly I'm, I'm well aware of the of the, the Tone Dexter and mm. of the um, you know, the machine learning aspects yeah. of of uh, pickups, and I I would say that that's where the future is headed. Mm. Um, the the pickup pickup development. I I think there are so many levels of user of a pickup. Mm. So the vast majority of people that that play the instruments. Uh, people who go to open mics mm. or, or play at church or, or um, play in a band with their mates once a month or something like that. Mm. Um, and whatever you do needs to work for them as well as for the high, you know, the, the top level professional. Um, and what, what I think, where, where I see it going is that the, the machine learning idea should make it simpler for for the the user at, at any level to, to work with. But I reckon I reckon there'll be a kind of um, ultimately there'll be a, a, a kind of preset mix, you know, a, a blend of controls and so forth that most users will use, and then we'll have some kind of um, ability to go in and get under the hood and, and create your own. Yeah, it's interesting you uh, say that. We, we, later on. we just had Chris Martin on from Martin Guitar, and he said he thinks the future is in apps, as most most um, apps are the future for lots of things, right? But that way you could have a preset thing in the guitar where you just use it, or you could go in as an expert user and dial it in with an app under the hood. Yeah, so I think that's you. a nice place. Yeah. But it's interesting. Yeah, I, I think that's where it'll go. But it's yeah. interesting because... What I see in the community now is that people are experimenting with impulse responses, but they don't, I, I see this a lot. They, they get something like a Tone Dexter, but they don't want to carry it to a gig. I mean, don't, don't ask me why, it's just one pedal. But I see people buying maintenance because they can just take it to the gig, plug it in, or open mic is a classic one. Like I, I don't, They say, I haven't got time to plug in pedals. I want to plug in my maiden, play the set, and get off. And indeed, that is a nice thing. So I guess the question is, where do you, where do you strike that balance between? Because once you start putting in the convolvers and things in that guitar, you're going to have a worse battery life. You're going to have people that complain that it's not fully analog anymore. Um, you're going to have these kind of issues, and then you still want the body sound, of course. So you want to still have, and you can't have a mic for the body sound. You're going to want like a sensor on the top or something. So you might have to change the whole thing. And I do think there's a market now for people that like like your system, because it's just, you just plug it in, you go. So it's very yeah. hard. It's hard to please everyone, isn't it? But it's good to know that you are yeah. researching that stuff. Oh, yeah, we're certainly working on it. And, um, uh, you know, eventually something will come out. But, I mean, it has to be, it has to be gig friendly. It has to work for for the majority of people that, that use these guitars. You know, and we have so many people that are, are pros on it. Yeah, in bars and clubs and mm. so forth, working four, five, six gigs a week, or back when there used to be gigs. That yeah. And, um, uh, you know, they, they just need that guitar to work and work and work. And they just don't mm. want to have to worry about that, that side of the, the game. So whatever we do, it's got to be, uh, it's got to be, slick it's got to be professional and it's got to work for the majority of users absolutely i i think the bar scene is the kind of staple for these things because when you play in different that's how i test these pickups i go to when i play again when, when i'm playing in bars i go around different bars and use them and i see do, does it work in every environment does it work in some environments and i think that's that's true you want to be able to take it to a bar plug it into any pa and sound great and i think that's something that the ap5 has on offer. It, it covers all that. And, and I, as I say in my review, if it's good enough for Tommy Emmanuel and people like him, then we're in a good place. But I guess we always have to look to the future as well, right? We have to always make sure we're keeping up with the trends. And I do think, I mean, you look at the electric guitar world, impulse responses in the Kemper and the Helix, that's, that, that is the future now, isn't it? And I think the acoustic world yeah. is starting to 
to come up to come on board with that as well. So, yeah, it's very interesting, and I, I wonder how how it will play out. But you know, what, again, one thing I love about the AP5 is that is the hundred hour whatever it is battery life. It's stuff like that is yes. important yeah. for a touring musician. You don't want to be worried about that stuff on stage. No, no, you don't. And that was actually one of the drivers behind not having a tuner built into uh, the system as well uh, to um, to uh, you know, maximise battery life. Uh, and there are any amount of tuners, particularly you know, headstock clip-on. Yeah. So yeah, I was going to ask you that actually. Yeah. Um, someone said, "Are you working on the current system? Is there going to be like an AP5 Mark II Pro II? Is there going to be a, a change in that design anytime?" Um, we probably, we, we can probably do some more work with the microphone. Hmm. I think, I think that would be where we'll focus. Uh, other than that, um, unless, unless we have, you know, uh, supplier problems with components or something where we may need to make a design change due to component shortage uh, I, I think it will remain as it is um, for the for the time being I think the next major um, acoustic pickup development from us will will be pretty major it won't be a subtle mm. thing it'll be um, uh, other than as I say other That's... than microphone it'll be a, a fairly um, fairly That's... That's game changing thing. That's exciting. Is that? I mean, I got to ask you now because you're on the line. Is that? You, you don't have to answer, but is that something we might see in like, like a couple of years or ten years? What sort of time frame are we talking about? Uh, more, more, more ten than a couple. Ah, okay. Close. Yeah, yeah. So fair way away. And would you still? Would you still talk to people like like Tommy Emmanuel for their input on that as well? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. You just yes. You're crazy if you don't. You've got. Mm. And, you know, people like Tommy, like Michael Fix, yeah. Nick Charles, um, John Butler, we've got all these people who, whose sound is critical to them and who are experts at, at what they're doing. And, uh, you know, we'll absolutely run everything past them and, and um, get I, their feedback and, and approval before we go any further. I think that's great. I think, I think more companies should, I mean, I'm sure companies do it, but I think companies should work with people that are actually doing that particular job and a broad range of them and really get their input into this stuff because they're the ones that are out using the products, right? Yeah. It makes yeah, yeah. it makes it makes a lot it makes a lot of sense. It really does. Well, that's awesome. So um yeah, let me just go make sure I didn't miss any questions, but this has been really interesting. And I've got to say, like they're not the easiest I mean, I'm in the States now and they're not the easiest guitars to get your hands on. But I know that like um, my friends at I see him every year. I see him at Summer Nam. Um, Artisan Guitars have a huge selection. Yeah. You've got other dealers. Yeah. You've, I mean, we've got people in the chat from all over the world, but you have dealers all over the world, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Awesome. Let me just check the chat here, make sure I didn't miss anyone's question. Um, thank you, Hofta Hoff NA. Your questions are really great. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I got them all. That's really awesome. Well, um, thank you so much. And I'll say to the people in chat, this will this, this this chat will stay online. So please do again subscribe to the channel, send this chat to your friends. I'll share it in the in the groups when it's up and, up and processed as well. Um, before we finish, I just want to show you my guitar on the screen because I got it out specially. And and this guitar, if I'm not wrong, I might be wrong. Was this developed in in conjunction with Keith Urban? Is that true? Uh, yes, Keith, yes, Keith was was uh, involved in um, yeah saying what he wanted in in a uh, a guitar. So yes, that's right. Yeah, I really like it. This is black. This is Australian blackwood, right? Australian blackwood. Yeah. 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 And is there a reason why you choose to use those woods and not things like you know the drift, like mahogany and um, Sitka spruce, those kind of things? Well, you use those as well, yeah. right? Yeah, we do. We do. We, we use a combination of Australian woods and traditional tone woods. Um, but the uh, the Australian woods help give us our character, for one thing. Mm. Secondly, um, they're here. They're on the doorstep, which which makes sense. Um, and yeah. they're really, really good tone woods. 
they're very, very good tone woods. Queensland maple and blackwood in particular are, um, are beautiful. Mm. Uh, we've also got the um, Tasmanian myrtle that uh, is coming out on the Joe Robinson model. Too, oh, wow. Which is a, a, another Australian timber that, um, you know, Australian makers have known about for years, but it's 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 never been out there in any kind of uh, numbers in the in the larger market. Uh, Walter says, any new plans on the electrics? Because again, electrics mate are always associated with the AP five and the acoustics, but you do make electrics as well, right? What's the what's yeah, the what's yeah. the plan with those? Okay, well, we're still making the BB twelve hundred. Um, unfortunately, we we had to temporarily anyway shelve the, the rest of the electric range um, because we were not able to keep up with our acoustic demand mm. and um, so it became a case of well do we try and spread ourselves too thin or do we focus our our talents and our, our time on the uh, acoustic range which is is uh, you know the demand is worldwide and, and growing mm. um, so unfortunately we just had to put them aside apart from that one model because we didn't want to leave them completely mm. but we had to put them aside for the time being um how many people work at the factory uh, the old line is about half <laughs> <laughs> that's a great answer <laughs> uh we we've got we've got about um we've got 54 on the floor in production mm. and around about 70 all told with um sales marketing and admin. And how important is, um, I'm just thinking of the chat I had the other day with Martin, like uh, CNCs and those kind of things. How, how, how has the technology changed in, in regards to production of the actual guitars themselves? Well, uh, we've been running CNCs now since the mid-90s. Mm. Uh, we recently got a, um, a five-axis CNC, which has helped enormously. And, and in, in the case of that, the technology is primarily about... Um, uh, providing as consistent a product as we can to the assemblers. There's still a lot of hand assembly. Um, so, you know, we sort of take the take the, the grunt work, if you like, away from, from having to push bits of timber past machines where we can mm. um, and produce, yeah, produce as close to a, a as close to a ready to assemble product as we can off the machines and then it's all symbol by hand so cnc is critical um mm. yeah i mean i started before we had any of them but uh, i certainly wouldn't want to go back to no oh, and it, it can make them more consistent as well right everything's more mm. consistent yeah um how many guitars do you make a year uh, around seven thousand at the moment oh, wow that's, yeah, that's quite a lot uh walter says he loves the electric guitars greetings from this maiden collector on the other side of the planet where are you walter <laughs> jason said our blackwoods that are, so blackwood is harder, right? And he says, are they therefore more resonant? I would assume they're less resonant. What, what's, what's the deal with black Australian blackwood? Uh, well, there's a lot of different blackwoods. Australian blackwood is a medium density timber. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's not as hard as rosewood. Mm. Um, probably it, it would be similar to hard mahogany, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. So it's more like a mahogany then. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because I know the woods you use. Uh, obviously, if you're into the the like again the standard kind of well standard for like Martins like the uh, Sitka spruce, the mahogany, and the Indian rosewood. But um, I think you you do make a guitar. I think there was, there was an artist model that uses those kind of materials, right? Um, the Johnson model. Am I right? Yes, that's right. Eric Johnson. Eric Johnson. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. That's right. Yeah. We also have our Messiah series has uh, Indian rosewood, ah. ebony, spruce. Yeah. And what's your personal favourite wood combination on a on a maiden? Oh, it depends what day of the week it is. <laughs> you like them all? That's a good answer. I, um, uh, but I'm very fond of blackwood. I've got um, uh, I have a blackwood 808 that I've been playing for 20 years that I love. Mm. Um, but I also learned to love Blackwood when we developed our ukulele series. Mm. Um, so that was uh, really got to love it then. Uh, at the moment, I'm having a love affair with Queensland Maple again, which is what the uh, EBG 808TE is made from. Right, right, That's right. That's a beautiful tone wood. Yeah. Do you think the, do you think the tone woods translate over the pickup system? 
Yes. You do, yeah. Yep. Um, and Pat says, can we ask more details about the Joe Robinson model? When will it be released? Greetings from Germany. Uh, yes, so it's actually, uh, we exhibited it at, at NAM, and uh, it's, it's in final stages of production now, so there should be, should be models shipping out very shortly. Mm. Very cool. Yeah, Joe Robinson's great. I actually didn't, I was at NAM. Were, were you at NAM this year, Winter NAM? No, no, I wasn't. Uh, we were. Uh, Neville and Linda and, and Mark were, but no, I wasn't. Yeah, I, I met I met Neville and Linda. They're they're really nice, and um, and I didn't see that model. I don't know why I missed that one, but that sounds like a really great model. Yeah. Um. Okay. Awesome. Well, look, I want to say thank you so much for your time because you had to wake up really early to do this. <laughs> like I can't. I still can't believe that I'm in New York City. It's five p.m. and you're in Australia and you're you're in the future. And it's that yes. early in the morning. I guess people are now coming in. Actually, I'm going to do yeah. something. This is just uh, off the off the cuff. You are in the factory right now. Would you, would yes. you would you mind would you mind just giving us to finish up, just walking outside and giving us some shots of the floor? Is that okay? Oh yeah, I can it might do that. it might be noisy, but I just think as you're there, it'd be great to see the actual yep. factory. Yeah, okay, that'd be yep. awesome. Thank you. Yep, let's do this. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cheers. This is live, live performance, isn't it's it? It's a live, a live tour. I love this. Yep. Okay, we're gonna head out now. <laughs> wow. Oh, they are working there. They start work early. So there you go. That's awesome. Well, look, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. We've we've loved we've loved this. Say hi to the team for me. Say hi to Mark. Oh, I, did, I forgot to say because Mark is from the same part of England that I'm from. We're born in the same oh, right. place. Yeah. We're born in the same place. It's such a small world. Um, yes. And this has been fascinating for me. I love the guitars. I love what you guys do. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for watching. And um, Patrick, just stay on the line. I want to say goodbye to you offline, okay? Yeah. But everyone else, I'm going to end the stream. Thank you so much. Uh, let, let me know if you've played one of these guitars, if, what, you, what you like about them in the comments below. And I'll see you on the next interview. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. Bye-bye.